chilling tales for dark nights. Fear of Hugh Written by Nicola Torch Performed by Daniel Radcliffe Audio production and music by Jeff Clement. I knew something was stirring, but I didn't want to know what. I knew something was watching me, but I didn't want to watch back. I opened my eyes wondering what I would see, hoping I wouldn't feel her presence there, stood, head bowed with her piercing, menacing eyes. However, I was again disheartened by the fact that she was there. She was here. I knew she was. She has been with me for so long that how could I forget her? As my eyelids shifted begrudgingly, a chill darted across my body like a firework in midwinter. My heart skipped a few beats and I knew that she would be aware of it, especially in the dark. Ghosts use the night as their playground. They can dance on their dwelling without a care in the world. They feed off fear, and they use that fear as a drug, which propels them into a state far worse than even their worst nightmares. My eyes were open wide now, and fixed on the girl who had haunted my slumber for so long, and who was stood by my bedside looking, just looking. I gulped, and her expression changed. She was coming for me, I knew it. She got closer and closer, until I could feel her icy breath whip across my cheek and her vile stench of death bleach my senses. I collapsed under her grip, which was too tight to escape from. I felt my lungs compressed, my ribs snap like a twig. But then, out of nowhere, light bathed the room in colors I was familiar with. I twisted my head to the source of my previous pain and she had vanished. She hated the light. In the light, nothing can hurt you. But in the dark, it is a completely different place, a place where even the strongest of people are most vulnerable. That is why she comes and goes. I know that in the dark, she can sense my terror. She hunts it down like a cat toying with her prey. The light is her only weakness. When a blanket of light erupts from the gap in my dusty curtains, I know that she has fled until again the night comes and she will be the stronger party and I the weaker once more. It's like a game of hide and seek, only you are being both sought and hidden. Night Terrors, narrated by Joshua Sheets. I've been told several times before that I was an absolute nightmare to look after as a little kid. Between my fear of the dark and my sleeping problems, I apparently spent a lot of nights in my parents' bed too afraid to sleep in my own room. Eventually my parents got sick of the constant sleepless nights with me tossing and turning in their bed, and finally put their foot down insisting I sleep in my own room. I responded in turn by flat out refusing to go to sleep without some kind of nightlight kept on in my room at all times. When my mom and dad tried to force the issue because they thought I needed to grow up. I'd sit there in bed, screaming like a banshee, and work myself into such a state I'd scratch the hell out of my arms and face and hit the wall until I had bruises everywhere. This apparently went on for years, yet I can't remember any of it, which doesn't really surprise me because for some reason I can hardly remember anything before I was about 8 years old. It's weird though, even now as an adult. I can't recall a single night that I didn't fall asleep with the PC or the television on in the background. Even when I would visit friends and stay over, I'd bring my old laptop with me so I had something to fall asleep to. I guess it's just one of those things that stuck with me, some deep subconscious habit in the back of my mind somewhere that I can't get rid of. We've had some problems at home recently with the electricity, thanks to a late bill, and we ended up having to get a meter installed in order to pay off the debt. I've tried to make sure I'm not wasting electricity wherever I can by switching off sockets and turning off lights when I leave a room. Basically any little thing that could make a difference. 
I still can't bring myself to turn off the computer or television before I go to sleep, though. I just can't do it. The other night, I was sitting in bed and drifting off to sleep when I heard the meter beeping out in the hall, warning me that the electricity was about to run out. I think I sat there for about ten minutes or so, listening to that bloody noise and dreading what was coming. Sure enough, the beeping stopped, and I heard the fan on the PC cut out as everything turned off, and I was left in total darkness. I lost my ship pretty hard and buried my head in my pillow, trying not to panic when I suddenly heard the faintest noise in my ear. It was then that all those memories from my childhood came rushing back to me, and I remembered that it wasn't me who'd been responsible for the scratches and bruises all over my body, and I suddenly realized exactly why I was so afraid of the dark. dark, dark, dark. Sarah O'Bannon, written anonymously, narrated by Otis Jiry. Coffins used to be built with holes in them, attached to six feet of copper tubing and a bell. The tubing would allow air for victims buried under the mistaken impression they were dead. Harold, the Oakdale grave digger, upon hearing a bell, went to see if it was children pretending to be spirits. Sometimes it was also the wind. This time, it wasn't either. A voice from below begged, pleaded, to be unburied. Yo, Sarah O'Bannon? Yes. The voice assured. You were born on September 17th, 1827? Yes. The redstone here says you died February 19th. No, I'm alive. It was a mistake. Please dig me up to set me free. Sorry about this, ma'am, Harold said, stepping on the bell to silence it and plugging up the copper tube with dirt. But this is August. Whatever you is down there, you ain't alive no more. No. No. And you ain't coming up. Years ago. My family went on a vacation in Cape Cod, and we rented a small old house to stay in for two weeks. On the main floor was the kitchen, the living room, and the bathroom. The bedrooms were on the second floor. There was a basement room downstairs, with a washer and dryer, a sofa, and a television. On the first night... <laughs> We were all awakened by a terrible scream from my sister's bedroom. When my dad burst into her room and turned on the light, he found her sitting up in bed, screaming and crying. My parents sat with her and comforted her until she finally calmed down enough to tell them what had scared her. She said that she had been awakened in the middle of the night by a horrible stench. When she opened her eyes, she had seen the entire bedroom soaked in blood, from top to bottom. There was blood all over the floor, bloody handprints on the wall, and blood spatter all over the ceiling. We all thought that she had just been having a nightmare. 
but she refused to go back into her bedroom and stayed in her parents' room for the remainder of the holiday. One evening, my mother was cooking dinner in the kitchen upstairs and my father had gone out on an errand in a nearby town. My sister and I were in the basement room watching TV when all of a sudden the light bulb popped and the TV went off, leaving us in complete darkness. The basement was unfinished and had old stone walls, making it a bit of a creepy place. For a few seconds, we just froze, not knowing what to do. Then we started to smell something horrible. It was a terrible stench, and when it hit our noses, we felt nauseous. It smelled like rotting flesh. The smell quickly grew worse and worse, and then we just heard a scratching in the darkness. Something seemed to be scratching at the floor or the walls. We screamed and began scrambling around in the pitch black, trying to find the door. Eventually we managed to open the door and ran upstairs screaming to our mother. We kept telling her about the disgusting smell and we heard something scratching and scraping around down there. My mother eventually agreed to go down to the basement, replace the bulb and check out the source of the horrible smell. She took a flashlight and a new bulb and disappeared into the darkened basement. As we waited for her at the top of the stairs, we expected her to return quickly, but she seemed to be down there for an eternity. Suddenly we saw her emerge out of the darkness and come running up the stairs. She slammed the basement door behind her and bolted it as fast as she could. She turned to us and we could see her face had completely drained of color. Her eyes were wide with fear and she just said, I don't want you going down there again. Then she went into the kitchen and called the police. We overheard her conversation on the phone and managed to figure out that she'd seen someone in the basement room. As she waited for the police to come, we huddled together in the living room, staring at the basement door. At any moment, we expected to hear someone banging on it or trying to break it down. My mother refused to tell us what she had seen. When the police arrived, my mother greeted them at the front door and ushered them inside. She unbolted the basement door and they went down into the darkness with their flashlights out and their guns drawn. They searched the entire basement room but found nothing. There was no other way out of the basement. No windows, no doors. Whatever was down there would have had to come up through the basement door. After the police left, my mother finally revealed what she had seen down there in the pitch black basement room. As she spoke, she became very still and quiet. She said that she had been changing the light bulb downstairs when she began to smell the horrible stench we had described to her. Then she started to hear a faint scratching noise. She shone her flashlight around the room and suddenly caught sight of something crouched between the washer and the dryer. It was a man, crouched on all fours. His clothes were tattered, his hair was wild and tangled, and his face didn't look human. It was twisted in an expression of pure hatred. In that split second, he looked up at my mother, his eyes reflecting the beam of her flashlight. Then he suddenly crawled forward and disappeared through the wall. When my mother saw him simply vanish into thin air, she dropped the flashlight and ran. After that, none of us would go down in the basement. We kept the door locked and bolted. Every night, we slept in our parents' room and locked that door too. We cut our holiday short a few days later and just drove home. My Son Liked Insects Written by Maggie Louise Narrated by Rebecca Peason Original music and audio production by Jason Hornack My son was an adventurer. He was four years old and with a large fenced-in backyard. One could say he had all the places in the world to explore, and certainly all the time. I would allow him to play in the backyard where I could see him while I was doing chores around the house. During this time, he had taken a liking to insects, one of my worst fears. Even the smallest cricket hopping around outside could send me into hysterics. 
One day, I was cleaning the oven when my son came running in through the door, his hands full of squirming worms. After nearly barfing all over the floor and screaming for him to take them out, though actually saying, that's so nice, Daniel, great find, now please get them out of here, he rushed back outside. The amount of worms in my son's hands had been enough to give my worried mind nightmares for two days at least. But Daniel was having fun, and he was a kid. What could I say? This occurred a few more times until I gave in and bought him a small habitat that he could keep on the counter and put bugs inside. I would oftentimes find a caterpillar, or cat I did, which we would feed and then empty back outside. I knew he was having fun with his adventures and discovering a lot of new things about all these insects. It was like a big learning project. One day, he came in with squirming hands as I did the dishes. I watched him pour maggots into the tank out of the corner of my eyes. I cringed and ran over to him demanding, where did you find these? They're absolutely disgusting and they can't be in the house. They wriggled around a piece of something decayed and rotten and the smell emanating from them was excruciating. My son just looked up and replied, I'm sorry, Mommy. I found them in the bowls outside. Bowls? I asked. Can you show me where you mean? I followed Daniel out into the yard until he came to a part of our yard closest to the forest, where he dug several holes. There, in the holes, were carved out human skulls still attached to the outside. Maggots writhed in and out of the eye sockets and gaping jaws. Daniel just looked up at me and said, I like all these bugs hanging out in our backyard. OCD Written by Edwin Crow. Narrated by Steve Taylor. I have obsessive compulsive disorder. I'm not a germaphobe or a checker. I just really hate odd numbers. It's hard to explain. I just don't feel right and I have to rectify it. If I see one shoe on the floor, I have to find the other one before the anxiety becomes unbearable. I buy food in pairs. I have two cars, even though I only use one. I was so delighted when my kids were born and I had twins, identical ones at that. They were the light of my life. And for the longest time, I got my OCD under control. It's amazing how the love for the children you created can change the way you think about things. How silly I was to think something as arbitrary as odd numbers could rule my life. Thank God for the miracle of life. When my daughter Sally became sick with pneumonia, it sent me into a depression. I watched as my sweet little child withered away. I sat on the chair next to her bed while the nurse came along and pulled the sheet over her face. Looking at the linen, pulled taut over my daughter's face. My legs started jittering. Cold sweat gathered on my brow. I hate odd numbers. What do I do with the other one? Written by an anonymous author. Narrated by Craig Groshek. As you call through the rugged cave, you think to yourself, I can do this. It's not so bad. The hole you're crawling through is unbelievably small. 
small enough that your body can just fit. Turning around is not an option. The windy turns you crawl through make it nearly impossible to crawl backwards. The flashlight is what's separating you from complete darkness. It's your guiding light. Your flashlight, however, is about to run out of batteries. But it's okay. Your friend crawling behind you has more than enough. According to your friend's calculations, you're only 200 yards in, with just 200 more to go. Your friend is an avid outdoorsman who loves exploring caves, so there's definitely nothing that can go wrong, right? Hurry up, you move like my grandmother! Yells. At which point you notice the hole you're crawling down seems to be getting smaller. Your friend tries to be funny and pushes you forward, knowing you're not used to this sort of experience. Then you're stuck. The hole is way too small. You try to wiggle your way through, but there's no use. The rock walls you're stuck between press against your gear, making it harder to breathe. Then you hear a, a moaning, groaning sound coming from behind you. And your friend gets louder, louder, and louder. Your friend screams a blood-curdling cry, a scream no man should ever make as he is dragged violently back through the cave in the blink of an eye. You hear his screams carrying farther and farther away. Your flashlight dies. Salt. Written by The Itch. Narrated by Caden Von Clegg. Featuring Anne-Marie and Corbin Lawrence. Audio production, sound design, and original score by Nick Ledesma. That is salty. My little boy Tommy said, cupping some of the water in the palm of his hand. Of course it is, son. I chuckled. You know the ocean's salty. Too salty. He exclaimed, and flung the offending liquid onto the sand. I came over and knelt down, leaving my paperback on the beach chair. I could see tears forming in his eyes. It's okay, son. I took his little hand and felt the wetness of the ocean water on my fingers. It was warm, and it tingled. Then the tingling increased, and the warmth turned to a heat. Tommy was right, it did burn. Then he began to cry. And then from down the beach, I heard a scream. Oh my god! I stood and squinted through the bright sun reflecting off the sand. The scream was joined by others from all around me, and I could feel the terror of everyone on the beach becoming one rising wave of panic. I saw a young girl run in with the surf, screaming, her tanned skin melting over her bikini. A fat man in a speedo ran in the water and fell. When his arms came up, they were boned to the elbow, with great flaps of dissolving skin hanging like cloth. A young man pulled his tiny daughter in by the arms, dragging behind her the stumps that had been her legs. I watched them come in, running, thrashing, falling, all of their skin melting from their horrified faces and revealing the white bone beneath. Tommy was crying. From high above, the sun beat down on the beautiful white sand of the beach. Child. 
Little Timmy loves to draw and color. He loves to play pretend with his friends on the playground. On the school bus, he talks and laughs with the children he's just met. He is such a good boy. But Timmy thinks there's a monster in this closet. The closet door would open, and beyond the coats and tidy Sunday clothes, Timmy would think he saw a face. The face of a monster, ready to swallow him whole. When he was scared, he would always ask his parents to check the closet, and they would. They would even go as far as to check under the bed, just in case. Tonight, Timmy is especially scared. He's screaming for his mommy, his daddy, for rescue from the monster in the closet. But there is no monster. I'm just a lonely school bus driver. And Timmy's parents are lying on the floor next to me. <laughs> Awkward Moments, written by Matt Demersky, narrated by Phil Santa Maria, original music and audio production by Jason Hornack. I always regret awkward social interactions and I can't help but obsess for days over what I should have done. This last one could have been particularly bad had I not chosen to avert disaster at the last moment. I was going for my daily run through the neighborhood when I noticed three kids playing, mostly unattended. A babysitter stood 30 feet ahead of me talking on her phone, her attention elsewhere. One boy seemed to be about mm, eight. A slightly younger girl threw a ball to him, caught it, then threw it to a much younger boy. He failed to catch the ball, and it bounced past him, somehow managing to fall into the slats of an old air conditioning unit out back of the nearest house. The unit was quiet and the fan was offline, but it was a hot day out, and I slowed my run out of concern. The younger boy ran up to the unit, climbed on top, and reached his arm down inside. Hey! I shouted at the boy. That's dangerous. That fan could turn on at any time. Uh, yeah. That's what I should have done, in retrospect. The kids would have screamed and run, thinking I was a dangerous stranger, but the boy would have pulled his arm out from the machine. Um, are you supposed to be watching those kids? I asked the babysitter as I passed her. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I should have done. She would have rolled her eyes and told me to mind my own business, but she would have made him get down from there. I stopped in place and lowered my sunglasses, looking in the boy's direction. The babysitter would have noticed and only momentarily thought I was some sort of creep staring at the kids. But then she would have quickly seen the danger herself and ran over to him. Uh, yeah. That's what I should have done. In the end, I chose to say nothing. I don't ever talk to people I don't know. I can't risk the embarrassment. I can't risk the endless replays I run in my head worrying about what I should have done over and over and over. As their myriad of horrified screams grew louder than the suddenly surging fan, as little red dots from the cloud of blood mist dotted my sunglasses. <sighs> I sighed with relief. That could have been so awkward. Looking Back by Sterling Moore Narrated by Jesse Cornett I fall flat on my face, blinking in shock. I go to push myself up. Nothing. My worst nightmare. I'm paralyzed. I want to scream, but my mouth isn't working properly. I can't breathe. I'm suffocating with my face half buried in the dirt. Soon, though, my panic begins to unexpectedly subside. 
I feel serene, weightless, just in time. Strong hands grip my hair and pull my head up off the ground. Looking back, I wonder dimly why my body stays behind. Night Watchman Narrated by Jonathan Jones. When my partner hadn't returned from patrol, I reluctantly went looking for him on foot. I found the patrol truck around the back of the empty warehouses abandoned in the darkness. <sighs> Come on, man. I shone my flashlight across the buildings then out into the woodland that surrounds us, only to see him standing motionless on the other side of the 15-foot-high security fence, staring intently out into the woods as if possessed. I called out to him. Hey, how'd you get over there? <gasps> he turned, startled, his eyes manically darting around. I was horrified to see his body was covered in deep cuts and his clothes were shredded. Uh, what the hell happened? I asked in shock, but he was too scared to speak. He looked up, so I shone the light where he was looking and saw the razor wire on top of the fence was dripping with his blood. What the hell? did you do? I exclaimed, but when I shone the light back on his face, he was frozen with fear, staring wide-eyed at something behind me. He gasped for air in panic before finally forcing out his words. For God's sake, man, climb the fence! An incident on a snowy mountain. Narrated by Otis Gyre. A photographer went to a snowy mountain with his assistant, commissioned to take a few pictures for a magazine article. They stayed at a log cabin, and a few days had passed when the assistant had an accident and injured himself. At that point, their work was still unfinished, and they felt they could not go home unless they finished it first. So, they decided to stay on the mountain. However, their injury got worse and worse, until the assistant suddenly died from it a couple of days later. But even so, the photographer would not go home. He was very committed to his job, and to leave the work unfinished was unimaginable to him. He decided to bury the assistant by the cabin and continue to work on his own. The following morning, when the photographer awoke, the assistant's dead body was lying beside him. I'm sure I buried him, he thought to himself. He was deeply puzzled. He went and buried the body again before going off to take pictures. But the same thing happened again the following morning, and the morning after that. On his final day, he decided to set the camera to automatic mode and place it by his sleeping bag so he could see what went on during the night. The next morning, the dead body was there beside him as he had expected. He buried it again, and then climbed down the mountain. When he got home, he developed the pictures he had taken the previous night. And there, in the pictures, he saw someone get up, go out of the cabin, 
carry the dead body back on the shoulder and lay it down beside his sleeping bag. That someone was none other than the photographer himself. Monster Written by Sterling Moore On Reddit's Short Scary Stories Narrated by Jonathan Jones I flipped through the manila folder in my hands one more time. You'd think that being on the job as long as I have, you'd get desensitized to this sort of thing. But you don't. At least, not when it involves kids. I walk into the interrogation room. The father sits, cuffed to the table in front of him like the monster he is. He doesn't look up as I walk in. I'm here for your statement. Silence. I start laying the pictures in front of him. A small, cluttered room. Boards on the windows, padlocks on the door. A bare mattress rigged with leather restraints. A boy, unconscious, in a hospital bed. We have your son in custody. I stare at the top of his head. We already have evidence to put you away for a long time. Silence. The tox screen came back. My words came out hot. Difficult to keep control. We know you've been drugging him. Silence. Denial is too good for this creature. Tell me what you've done to him. We are going to find out. This time he shifts in his seat, mutters something about protecting him. Uh, He's one of those. Yeah, I know your type. My hands are on the table now. I lean in. You sickos delude yourselves into believing that you are the hero for guarding your kids from the big bad world. That you are- I wasn't protecting him from anything. He finally looks up at me, expressionless, weary almost. Before I can respond, the door slams open behind me. I spin around. The child opens his mouth, unnaturally wide. He lunges. We Were Happy Written by Alan Braha Narrated by Joseph Gable Featuring Kelly Fitzgerald Sound and Music Production by Jason Hornack One day, my fiancé said that something was bothering her. My fingers were too long and slender. They made her feel like the Grim Reaper touched her at night. So I took a knife and chopped them, one by one to be half as long. The bone showed a lot of resistance, but I got through after a few strong chops. My love sat with me the whole time, sharing my pain and telling me how much she appreciated what i do for her. And we were happy. As I pet her with my stumps, she looked at me and said that my eyes were asymmetrical and it bothered her because it made me look judgmental. So I took a spoon and dug out my smaller eye, leaving a dangling eyeball that I cut with scissors. That was the most painful part, but... I didn't want my love to feel judged. My fiancé cleaned up the mess and afterwards came to hug and comfort me. And we were happy. A few days later, she said that my accent bothered her. It was too... foreign for her taste. So I took the scissors again, and I cut until I was certain my speech wouldn't bother her ever again. It took two tries to sever completely, but it was worth the pain. And we were happy. A few days later, after I had recovered and returned from the hospital, 
I returned to work. All of my coworkers had been worried, but they just didn't understand. After work, I returned home and found a letter on the door, which read, I'm confused. You're not the man you used to be, and I'm not sure I love the new you. I don't know if I'll come back. Wherever she is, she must be happy. Slowly Losing Grip by Elizabeth LOL Narrated by Otis Jiry Never one to dress up, short eyeliner and a sloppy updo. For her, today was different. Figuratively, my mouth dropped, but literally I couldn't break eye contact. Only once has she dressed this way. That was the day she promised herself to me. So today must have been special. She makes her way down the stairs towards me, and I can't help but smile. She's the prettiest thing I've ever seen. I reach out to embrace her as she nears, but there's something different, something off. She's walking towards me, but she isn't nearing. Doctor, he's waking up. I try to call out to her, but my voice catches in my throat. Everything stands still. Increase the sedation. She's fading away. The room is so bright. I can feel my mind being pulled away from my body, slowly losing grip. He's waking. The sedation isn't working. Good God, put him back under. We can't have him waking up now. I open my eyes. Blinded at first, the room is absolute white. The pain hits. Oh God, it hurts so badly. I look down. I'm strained. My body is a mangled mess of skin and bone. There are so many hands inside of me. I can see my guts. What happened? Where am I? Why am I so sleepy? She jumps into me, and I fall back, laughing. She's so lovely. He's out again. Good, 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 good. We can't afford any unnecessary stress while we're harvesting. Narrated by Jonathan Jones Tonight's like every other night. You lay there, in the dark, in silence, alone. With no company other than your thoughts. You shift and roll throughout your bed. Just you and your thoughts. You ponder, you plan, and you fantasize. Anything to distract you from the ringing silence. Silence that surrounds you. You hear a creak. A common sound to hear on such a still night. But you still recoil when the sound hits your ears. You hear the sound almost every night. But the sheer unexpectedness sets off a trigger in your head as paranoia takes over. The thoughts that once illuminated your mind are now darkened. What was once pleasure and success has now turned to demons and killers. The silence that your mind was distracting you from has now become the focus. You lay there, silent, listening for any obscure sound, hoping that the silence doesn't leave. Every little noise adds to your paranoia. And the silence lingers as you await the next unexpected occurrence. You're too afraid to open your eyes at the thought of seeing anything 
your mind can conjure. So you lay there, alone, in fear. The fear builds up in your mind as you try to find a quick escape from anything it creates. You revert to your childhood solution, hiding under the covers. You pull the blanket over your head and lay in silence. You hear noises, but they don't seem as scary. You figure if they can't see you, you're safe. The heat builds up under your blanket, but you put up with it simply for the comfort it supplies. You begin to calm down and relax and revert back to your usual logical self. It's just you and your thoughts again, alone under your blanket. You think of how silly it was to get so scared and worked up over a silly little noise. Eyes closed, you lift the blanket off of your face as the built-up heat is released. You breathe a sigh of relief and roll over, only to hear a deep, grating voice whisper. Oh, there you are. As the sound of footsteps creep towards your bed, Ride? Yeah. Come on, hop in. It was past midnight now, and I still had a while until I met my destination. The girl I picked up an hour ago was asleep in the seat beside me. She was a hitchhiker. I couldn't leave a teenager alone at night in the pouring rain. I had to pick her up. She seemed pretty happy that someone was finally giving her a ride. And I didn't know her real name, only that her friends called her Joe. She looked so calm, so peaceful. Her brown hair obscured half her gorgeous face. Her lips flexed in a barely noticeable smile. She must be having a nice dream. Tried to remember the last dream I had, but I had no luck. And then, I felt it. A feeling I hadn't felt in a long time. A terrible, ugly feeling. I looked down at the girl as I drove hoping her smiling face might help me overcome and not give in to the demon within. But I could feel it clawing to get out. I didn't want to. I couldn't. I needed to get the girl out of the car, but that would take too long. It would happen before then. I continued to struggle, fighting an inner battle, and then... No. I couldn't contain it. It happened. I let out the most monstrous fart I had ever released. It was legendary. It was the kind of thing kids would tell stories about to scare younger kids. I reluctantly looked to see if the beast that escaped my body had woken the girl. It hadn't. But the smile had faded. And she looked to be having a nightmare now.
Thanks for listening today. I want to take a moment to ask you to support us by joining the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights members area. There are links in the video description below. For as little as $6.66 a month with an annual membership, you can help our channels grow while ensuring you never run out of the audio entertainment you know and love. Thanks again for listening. Visit us at chillingtalesfordarknights.com slash tour for information and to sign up now. Chilling Tales for Dark